Okay, hi everyone, and, and thanks for joining us at the symposium. Uh, we have some absolutely great case studies coming up, um, and I'm honored to be able to introduce uh, the first. Um, first of all, we have uh, a, a Mr. Jonathan Gleaning and a uh, Miss Bree Jones. They are both PhD candidates at the University of Melbourne, and they are co chairs of the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences uh, Student Advisory uh, Council. So I'd, I'd love to just uh, turn it over to them. Uh, the title of uh, their case study is Amplification of Student Voice Through Student Staff Co-Design and Implementation of a Strategy-Focused Student Advisory Council. Hi everyone, sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land um, on which this presentation takes place, ours is the Wanduri people of the Kulin Nation and um, uh, for the elders past and present and emerging. Um, my name's Bree Jones and I'm a PhD candidate and chair of the, um, or co-chair of the Student Advisory Council for Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences. And I'll be presenting today with Jonathan Glenning and hello everyone. I'm I'm Jonathan, as as was said, and I'm a third year PhD candidate as well, and and the other co-chair of the uh, Student Advisory Council within our faculty. So today we're um as as Bree said, we're going to be discussing how we actually applied a co-design approach uh, towards establishing and implementing uh, a student advisory council within our faculty at the University of Melbourne. And so to sort of do that, we're going to go through bit of a wheel of, of the different stages of um, the co-design process and, and, and sort of the, the engagement uh, process uh, with, with our, between students and staff. So really to sort of give you a bit of a background as to why we did this, um, we started to do this because um, there was a real desire, um, you know, from senior faculty and from students and especially uh, from the faculty's level, um, in response to sort of data on declining student experience within the faculty, um, this I, they wanted to have foster this idea of an improved culture of student engagement um, between senior levels of the faculty and students, um, and one that was really much more prospective and forward thinking. Um, sort of what the existing process was before that was you have a student on a committee or, or something like that throughout all the various faculty and, and departmental and school committees, but it was really a lot more um, sort of retrospectively focused. The policy would have been made and it would be down to that committee to, to either implement it or to sort of work out the, uh, the, the teething issues. Um, and that was where the student came in rather than coming in a lot earlier in the process where they can actually positively impact the policy being made. So there was a really strong engagement uh, from the faculty leadership team um, to engage with students to further develop this idea. So. Um, we had a, we had a senior leadership team, um, which was comprised, you know, the Dean of the faculty, along with the associate Dean for graduate research and the associate Dean for learning and teaching. Uh, and they essentially invited a bunch of different students, some coursework students, uh, both postgrad and undergrad graduate research students, um, and also members of the faculty learning and teaching unit who are professional staff, um, to come together, uh, over a series of, of, workshops and meetings and, and and whatever we sort of felt we needed to sort of flesh this all out um, and engage with them to really um, develop this idea further. So like Jonathan said, we uh, designed this process where we had a number of collaborative workshops that were planned with the co-design team. And so we had kind of broad representation of students from undergraduate, postgraduate coursework, research training and members of faculty and student support services. And we all came together to kind of um, come up with this, um, you know, think of, you know, what are our, these, these like collaborative workshops really were opportunities for us to kind of unpack what our experiences are, um, discuss kind of our hopes and visions for the faculty and to discuss how students can be engaged as meaningful partners with the faculty um, in decision making. So it really allowed us to kind of exchange these ideas and talk about how we can grow and improve culture um, of collaboration with the faculty. And so from this, 
um, you know, we decided or came up with this idea that we could implement a student advisory council that would be kind of idea generation and prospective thinking like Jonathan just mentioned. So as Bree said, this was our sort of broad decision uh, that we would implement a student advisory council and it would be situated at the highest level of the faculty. So it would report directly to the dean and the faculty executive committee rather than sort of sitting within uh, you know, a sort of specific committee or, or, or lower down in the governance um, sort of food chain, I guess. And, and as also Bree said, the, this was the key thing. It was designed to be a two-way street, one that was both providing advice on request, um, but also acting as this proactive idea generating body. Um, so we could go to, to whoever the relevant leader or stakeholder was and say, look, we know you're doing X, Y, and Z, but we think actually you know, it might be better if we could talk about this topic or, or you know, we have an idea around that topic that, that we think um, we'd like to discuss further with you. Uh, and we'll go into those a little bit in sort of case study form in a, in a few minutes. And really, we also designed the terms of reference for the Student Advisory Council, um, you know, amongst the full co-design team. Um, and we also got a lot of advice from from relevant stakeholders and leadership throughout the faculty and students throughout the faculty. Um, and we wanted to make sure we struck the right balance in terms of sort of having a very clear structure that, that was, that was uh, rigid and allowed for, you know, that gave sort of structure, purpose and a, a clear direction to everyone, but also flexibility to sort of change it and come up with it as we went and, and um, really ensuring that, that the students who are on this, uh, this council have the appropriate supports in place. So as Jonathan said, we created this kind of student advisory council structure. And so the membership consisted of 26 student volunteers. And these student volunteers um, were drawn from the breadth and the depth of, I guess, of um, programs across the faculty. So we had undergraduate students um, that were in our various coursework programs. We had postgraduate students who were in different areas of research training. And whilst we wanted to make sure, uh, and they were, you know, drawn from a number of our different schools and research discipline areas, um, we want to, the council itself, we, we weren't we're not representative of every single student that exists in the faculty, but we want it to be diverse enough um, and have, I guess, another, um, you know, student voice or another body really that didn't um, necessarily replace any of our other existing associations that we have, but enabled us to amplify the student voice within the faculty at this high level. And so the student membership, um, they had 12 month terms um, and students then had the option about whether or not they wanted to have an extension. So the structure of the Student Advisory Council really is this kind of overarching council structure with those 26 members. And then it consists of two sub-councils. And so one council is for coursework and then one council is for research training. And the idea behind that structure really was that each of these you know, different or diverse groups of students may be working with different areas of leadership and they have very different student experiences, although they still want to have an overall, um, you know, a good experience within the university. Um, and each of the um, councils had a chair and a co-chair. Um, the council itself, in as part of the terms of reference, we aim to kind of meet um, every two months during the year and it would be in the way that the council would meet um, first together as a group and then the, the next two months then we may have our divisions where our sub councils meet and then we would come back together two months later um, as a collective council and meet and so forth and um, the support for our councils in terms of the executive support provided in terms of minute taking communicating to students circulating minutes um, and and um, sending out paperwork or any readings or anything like that that needed to happen and policy that we needed to look over before meetings um, was supported by our faculty um, learning and teaching support unit. Yeah, so sort of a bit of a, a brief history as to where we've gotten to since then. Um, we first implemented this council in sort of November of 2022, even though we sort of started talking about it a lot earlier around April. Um, took a lot of time for I to get the terms of reference together and go through all the processes in terms of expression of interest for, for chairs and members and all that kind of thing. 
So after we implemented it uh, first met in November, we've then since then set up the SAC processes in terms of how we meet uh, within ourselves, how we meet with senior leadership and other stakeholders, what the communication processes are um, sort of from us out and from them in, um, and a lot of other things around, you know, what is it that we'll actually uh, sort of take on and, and go to, uh, you know, uh, look at, look into in terms of policy areas, you know, will we sit on um, certain faculty committees as a member in, in addition to the existing student member so that we have sort of visibility and, and, and um, communication within to the, into those um, committees and sort of a lot of those kind of processes. We also set up a website where we sort of have a bit of information about what the SAC is. Um, there's there's a, a live, all year live um, sort of expression of interest form for students to, to sign up if they, you know, want to be involved or, or, you know, have any ideas, things like that. Um, it's also an area that has a submission form for staff to provide um, any documentation or questions that they have that they would like the Student Advisory Council to um, talk to or, or, or provide advice on. The other thing we've done since November is um, all of our members underwent leadership training and, and professional development, which was something that we felt very strongly about as, as a necessary thing to ensure that, um, you know, we are all volunteers. So it's important that that there's sort of, you know, something that you can get out of it at the end rather than just being uh, someone who just goes in and, and um, you know, gives a bunch of stuff and gets nothing really out of return, but also ensures that actually they're better members for it. They um, get practical training on how to, you know, how to act appropriately in this kind of structure in terms of conversion and divergent thinking, or in terms of, um, you know, how to how to be, how to represent, you know, not just your views, but sort of the views of all of your student cohort, or or how to, um, you know, communicate more effectively in, in a professional sense, uh, all those kind of things, um, and they were very valuable um, opportunities for our members. So from those same training um, sessions and other things, we um, spent a while coming up with sort of an overarching mission statement and, and values in order to ensure that we we're all aligned and directed um, in the same way. And so we came up with this mission statement of our mission is to amplify the student voice and to advise faculty on strategy to enhance students' as university experience and well-being. And we also came up with three sort of broad values, serve, aspire, and connect. Um, and we didn't realize it at the time until afterwards, but uh, service by connect also uh, equals SAC, which was rather a uh, funny coincidence, which we didn't appreciate. So I'm just going to share with you uh, just a short case study on one of the things that we've been working on this year. Um, and this is kind of in this idea of one of the roles of the SAC is to kind of provide feedback. Um, and so... Um, we have worked with um, senior leadership in faculty and recently at our university, they have released an advancing students in education strategy um, to work towards, it's quite aspirational for 2030. Um, and it's got a number of, you know, priority areas and commitment areas in it. And so with faculty, we were given the opportunity to work through um, this strategy. And then as a, a student advisory council say, well, what areas of this strategy are priority from a student perspective. And so we identified five top priority areas. And then what we did was then we worked through the key commitment areas in a number of kind of different ways of, um, you know, voting and, and, and putting preferences forward. And then we nominated key areas to focus on within those priority areas. And so that was given to the faculty's teaching and learning team. And they're going to then use those priority areas that have been identified, I guess, to then align um, with their, um, how they're going to, um, what activities they're going to do to then start to initiate and implement the university's advancing students in education strategy. So that's one example of this providing feedback. And then Jonathan is now going to talk to one that's a little bit of a different case example. Yeah, so as we sort of said, it was a two-way street. So um you know, sort of providing feedback is them coming to us. And then in terms of idea generation, um, us going out, our faculty recently um, has been undertaking a sort of a, what they've called the future faculty review. But um, 
as many of you may know, in the process of uh, creating strategic uh, plans and things like that, um, as soon as you sort of put out the first one, um, you're straight on to work into the next one. And they usually last, last about a, as half a time as, uh, as, as we sort of say they will. So last year, the faculty re released their Advancing Health 2030 strategy. And now they're already hard at work looking towards sort of the strategy for 2040. And so that was what this future faculty review was about. And so we went into this review um, with a lot of ideas and, and, and to sort of provide our ideas and, and, to, and to give um, our thoughts on the future of the faculty, given, given that we are the workforce of the future. So what we did is we advocated for um, a lot of different things, but for training students via a lot more realistic assessments um, and also including um, a lot of you know sort of breakthrough technology such as chat gpt and, and sort of other you know, ai and all that kind of stuff and ensuring that um you know these kind of things like those and internships and all those kind of things are are brought into our education system and not sort of shunned but actually actively sort of fostered we teach our students how to use these technologies how to get the most out of these internships and sure everyone has the opportunity to use to have these internships things like that we also talked a lot about sort of agile systems that permit rapid evaluation and feedback, both in terms of students providing um, sort of feedback to staff, but also from ensuring that staff can give better uh, feedback to students quicker. And so that students can actually, you know, take on this feedback and, and use it effectively rather than having it sort of, you know, getting feedback for one assignment and then the next three assignments don't actually matter at all about the sort of same content of that feedback related to in, feedback in assignment one. And so it's kind of useless. We also talked a lot about opening pathways um, for PhD students and, and PhD graduates as well into clinical training degrees because um, being a faculty of medicine, dentistry and health sciences, uh, this is a, it's about bread and butter and, and a lot of what we do. Um, we also did a lot of work on advocating to faculty for longer term contracts for early career researchers and ensuring that um, the sort of the, the casual contracts that graduate researchers are often put on during their um, candidature for casual teaching and things like that. Um, are a lot uh, have a lot better conditions in them and we've made some great strides in that uh, area. So I'm just going to quickly touch on some of our key learnings from this year and last year that we can share with you. And I guess the the, the number one thing is that this advisory council and this co-design project that we've been working on, it has a long-term horizon. And um, really that these sort of um, I guess kind of like projects need to be sustained over a period of time and they can't just be dependent on the students that are volunteering. And so they require significant administration support from, um, you know, from the faculty to be able to support the students in doing this because students are still students. We need to be studying. We need to be achieving our own milestones and we can't be, you know, doing all of the, I guess, kind of organisation um, around, you know, paperwork and those sorts of things and, and, and preparing mi meeting minutes and that. And so that's been a really good help in terms of us um, with the Student Advisory Council. The other thing that they need is that they need staff who are going to be invested um, and believe in um, the student voice and want to involve students um, at this level of faculty leaderships. So the staff really have to have, a, you know, you know, really put their social capital into and behind these sorts of um, projects. Um, and like I was saying, because this is a long-term horizon, we have to have mechanisms in place for this to be sustained in the long term. A lot of kind of co-design projects that we've, Jonathan and I have seen and have worked on um, previously have been short-term horizon. And so once you start to get this long-term horizon, we've got a significant period of change that we're about to embark upon where Jonathan and our I and our other leadership team are going to then be leaving. And then we've got this kind of handover and succession planning process where we need to hand over to a new group of leadership and then also to a new uh, group of members and be able to kind of sustain this trajectory over time. Um, and all of that is quite time intensive. Jonathan and I and our other leadership group really saw value in this and we were involved in the co-design from the beginning. 
um, and the next group or iteration will come in at a different period in the co-design process. So, you know, whether or not they will have the same motivations or have the same investment into the Student Advisory Council as this group has, you know, that's a bit of uncertainty. So it really comes down to as well discussions that we're having with faculty at the moment. If we've got these sorts of initiatives, how are students recognised for their time? whether it be that it's, you know, remuneration um, or an honorary position or, um, you know, like Jonathan said, you know, engaging in training um, and those sorts of activities. But it is something that's really important and needs to be considered to allow sustainability of these projects. So these are our references and uh, we just have to acknowledge everyone that was involved, um, you know, all of our members and, and also many different key staff who, who have provided so much support. And as Bree said, a lot of, you know, their political capital and, and social capital in, in enabling us to be able to exist and to, to do the work and, and have the impact that we've already had. Um, so thank you very much for listening and, and uh, we'll take any questions. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you, Bree and Jonathan. And at this time, I would just like to open it up to any questions. You can either turn on your microphone or if you'd like, uh, you can type your question in chat. While you're typing or thinking of your questions, I'd like to start off, yeah. if I might, with the first question. Um, I love how you uh, involved training um, and, and sort of upskilling of, of your uh, your um, SAC. Um, how did you decide on the type of training, the method of training, and whether it would be internal or external? So, I mean, in terms of sort of how we decided, I think um, that those of us who were sort of involved in the whole um, sort of development of, of the SAC, uh, we sort of thought, well, what is it we feel we need to be able to, to succeed in this role? Um, you know, what's been helpful to us that we've already might have received or, or what is something that we haven't received we, we feel might be helpful. And we've also had conversations with, with many staff around what they also felt might be helpful for us to succeed. And that sort of gave us the list of what training we wanted. In terms of whether it was internal or external, um, we didn't have the internal capacity really at that stage to um, do that training. Um, we sort of had internal capacity for mentoring and things like that, but, but not for actual training. So we went externally. Um, we since um, our faculty has hired someone to whose entire job is to do uh, is to be internal and do that training. So we've been working really closely with them over the last couple of months since they started to um, sort of bring them up to speed and, and really develop um, a good sort of training program for uh, for next year's SAC and, and onwards. And, and hopefully that'll be a lot more um, responsive and can really adapt as necessary to, to the needs and, and desires of each group. Um, I, I think there was a middle that? one I've forgotten. That's all right, John. Do you mind if I just add to that quickly sure. as well? Um, it, I just wanted to also acknowledge that the, the faculty and the teaching and learning support unit really wanted to make sure at the beginning that they were there to be able to provide support for us, but they didn't want to influence the SAC. And so another reason why we went with the external training at the beginning as well was so that we had that external perspective. Um, and since then, like Jonathan said, we have been able to kind of like figure out what our needs are and we can do more of an internal training process. But there was, um, a, you know, a lot of recognition at the beginning that they didn't, they, they didn't want to have their employed staff to influence what we were doing, what our direction was and what we determined that we, what impact that we wanted to have. And I think that's really, really important um, in developing a group like this that has autonomy um, to kind of develop up, you know, what it is that they're going to and what influence they want to have at this level in faculty. We have one question in the room as well. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I thought that was me. Someone else go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, great presentation. You were really thorough on how and the um, methods to set up and sustain such a group. Like you, I'm a PhD candidate and student rep. I'm interested in knowing how it seems that you set up a very good mechanism for voice and that was taken very seriously. 
to what extent were what you put forward acted on the ideas or the feedback you know how real was this in the at the end of the day uh, i mean I, I can certainly talk to to some of it um admittedly a lot of our time this year has been spent just establishing the council and creating those mechanisms so we haven't had as much time for more of the strategic work but we sort of felt that it was best to to set up the foundations this year so that then future uh, generations within the student advisory council can do and focus a lot more on that in terms of the strategic work we have done um as we sort of talked about a little bit in that last um that last case study around idea generation um a lot of the stuff that we advocated for within the um the future faculty review and especially around sort of short-term contracts um our faculty is now undertaking a review to ensure that they are aware of, of all of the the um you know, the different types of employment in our faculty. And to put in context, our faculty is about 60 something percent of the University of Melbourne in terms of both staff and money. And, um, you know, we've got like 12,000 students, another sort of 10,000 staff. It, it's a very, very, very large um, faculty. So they're um, undertaking quite a serious review around that and also creating funds um, to ensure that, and, and new policies to ensure that the default, um, you know, employment method going forward is, is continuing rather than short term. We've also had a lot of impact in terms of um, our advocacy around feedback, for example. Um, we now have a funded and, and um, you know, a policy that's, that's being implemented and starting in December around um, feedback from staff to students and how to ensure it's, it's better, more timely. And that'll also involve a lot of um, work around redesigning assessment, redesigning courses to ensure that they are um, better for, for students and, and, and have more realistic assessment, all that kind of thing. And that's just the first part of a much larger body of work that we all recognise um, now and we're sort of working towards around sort of feedback up from students as well um, and a lot of other things around that. So that's sort of some of the work I guess we've done and, and it really has had quite a bit of impact, which we're very grateful for and very glad um, to have. I'm also just going to add to that as well, Jonathan, if you don't mind, just um, mm. to in that, you know, we have had situations, so we've had, we've had you know, that impact and it's been really really amazing and again I, I believe that it is contingent on the staff leadership at the time and this is where I really want to have structures or mechanisms in place to be able to make sure that you know that, that you can check in and make sure we're tracking along that um, and part of our new terms of reference that we've got moving into next year are around the leadership of the SAC having regular meetings with the faculty leadership where we have, um, you know, agended things and 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 they have meeting minutes and we're checking in on projects. And so we're monitoring, you know, what actions have been made on those projects over time as well, because we have had circumstances too when, you know, we've put forward some feedback and then that hasn't been acted on. Um, so, um, you know, with different, you know, you know, in a smaller level. So I guess that that's a kind of mechanism to be able to make sure that that's tracking along as well in the future. I hope that answers your question. 